So you've been playing for a while now, working hard, fully decked out in iron from head to toe. But you need to get deeper. You need to get diamonds. What else are you going to stumble across in the depths? Minecraft is a game with nearly unlimited possibility. It's about as open world as you can get. Explore, fight, gather, create. You can do whatever you choose to set your mind to. But the same things that make Minecraft great may also make it overwhelming, especially for newer players. And that's why this video exists. I can't tell you how to play, but I can help you discover what you can do to get you started, and for some more experienced players, maybe help you brush up on the basics. Welcome to Minecraft Caves Notes. Let's go ahead and mine right into today's topic. In our first mining video, we talked about the different depths that ores can be found at. But unfortunately, there's a key point that I didn't mention that I think is really important, and it has to do with diamond generation. Although it is true that mathematically diamond ore generation is most likely down near the bottom of the world, there are a couple of factors that work against this and lower rates in these areas. The first is bedrock. At minus 64, bedrock generates a full unbreakable layer, but it also generates scattered through the few levels above it. Additionally, lava covers all open air pockets at minus 55 and below. Taken together, this means that finding diamonds at these lowest 10 levels can actually be difficult. Ultimately, it's more efficient to choose a Y level slightly above lava generation to mine for diamonds, somewhere between minus 50 and minus 54, for example. In Chapter 7, we went over the basics of starting a mine. It's time to add to that as well. Strip mining is the process of making parallel tunnels branching out from your main path. The goal is to maximize the number of blocks that are exposed while balancing the effort needed to clear them. To start a strip mine, simply tunnel in one direction for a short period of time, then turn and branch out to the left or right, and repeat this pattern down your central tunnel. Additionally, you could work in some vertical variation to your tunnels, like this. Of course, eventually you are likely to run into a cave, or maybe even an underground structure. So let's take a look at Minecraft's three cave biomes next. The first underground biome we'll look at is dripstone caves. In our real world, planet Earth, caves like this exist all over the globe. Personally, I've had the opportunity to see these underground formations in the U.S. at Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico. The formations arise due to mineral deposits that slowly accumulate from water seepage. Minecraft mimics this real-life phenomenon by including a brownish stone type called dripstone for the cave walls and major formations, and a partial block called pointed dripstone for stalactites and stalagmites. Downward-facing pointed dripstone is unique in the sense that they can be attached to the underside of a block, but if their support is broken, they become gravity-affected and will fall, damaging mobs that they might hit. Likewise, upward-facing pointed dripstone will deal additional fall damage to mobs that drop onto it. Although the dripstone caves do not add much in terms of blocks, they do have two additional features. First, while drowned may normally only spawn in rivers and oceans, in dripstone caves, drowned may also spawn in water as long as their other spawn conditions are met. Also, copper gets a significant generation boost here, making it far more abundant. This may not be saying much, since copper is already abundant, but if you do have a project that needs a large amount, this may be a worthwhile place to visit. Lush caves offer something very unique to Minecraft's underground, foliage, and lots of it. Lush caves have several unique blocks and items, as well as a special friendly mob you won't find elsewhere. On top of all that, lush caves actually have a hard-coded clue above ground, Azalea trees will grow above a lush cave's biome, even in places that don't normally have trees at all, like the desert or badlands. Azalea trees use the standard oak log block for their trunks, but have azalea leaves and flowering azalea leaves, which may drop azalea bushes instead of the typical saplings. Azalea bushes may be planted and grown like saplings as well, but must be bone mealed. They won't sprout into azalea trees on their own. Under azalea trees is a special kind of dirt called rooted dirt. At this time, there's no specific additional use for rooted dirt, but it can be useful for builders and terraformers looking to add some spice into their paths or gardens. Rooted dirt may also generate hanging roots underneath if the bottom of it is exposed to air. 
And back down in the caves, you'll find plenty more azalea bushes and tall grass growing on a bed of moss blocks. Moss blocks may also generate moss carpets, or you can craft them from the blocks themselves. Moss carpets are not flammable, like regular carpets are, but can be used the same way. Personally, if I want to light up a grass area, I enjoy using moss carpets to cover in-ground lighting to make it less conspicuous. From the ceilings of the caves, you may see spore blossoms dropping particle effects. Don't worry, these won't hurt you and are purely decorative. Just break them to collect them if you want. There is no way to grow them yourself. But perhaps most importantly, glow berries will help illuminate the area, and their vines can also be used for climbing. But there's still a bit more. Large clay deposits cover the ground in many places and help to create small water pools, which may also have drip leaf growing out of it. Not only is this a great place to collect clay if you need it, but tropical fish and the amphibious axolotl live down here. There's a lot going on in lush caves. The final cave biome only generates under higher terrain in Minecraft, and mostly generates in negative Y levels, though it can absolutely reach higher than level 0 and often does. This helps make the biome feel like it is even deeper underground, which makes sense as it goes by the name of the Deep Dark. Unlike the lush caves, there isn't a specific tell for finding Deep Dark, but if you want to intentionally go looking for it, look under mountains, or more specifically, mountainous terrain. There is no set surface biome required for the Deep Dark, but instead, the higher the altitude at the surface, the more likely it is to generate underground. And a broader area of higher terrain means more area for Deep Dark to generate under it, increasing the chance that you will not only find the Deep Dark biome itself, but also the exclusive structure it can generate. Because of the specific mechanics and nuances of the Deep Dark, I've decided to give it and the Ancient City their own dedicated chapter, so check out the second part for a deep dive into the darkness. Biomes aren't the only thing you're likely to find underground. Some structures are rarer than others, but if you spend enough time in the mines, you will find them. Technically, aside from the Ancient City, you should be able to find most of these above Y0, but I saved them for this video because I felt like you will be more likely to see them once you're searching for diamonds, given the fact that it will usually take much longer to gather your diamonds than it did to get the iron you need. Let's get started with the dungeon, or what is now known as the Monster Room. And the reality is, that's pretty much all it is. One small, squarish room with a monster spawner inside. In vanilla survival Minecraft, these will only be one of three types of hostile mobs either zombies, skeletons, or spiders. Unless the room has been cut by additional cave or structure generation, which can and does happen occasionally, the room should have one to two loot chests. While not typically amazing loot, there are some less common items that you can find here, such as saddles and name tags. You can destroy the spawner by mining it with a pickaxe, and it will yield some XP. But most players will typically choose to just light up the room instead, which can be done with a single torch on top of the spawner. Lighting the area will stop the spawner from producing mobs, and then it can be used at a later time to make a mob farm, but the choice is up to you. Abandoned mine shafts can be found at just about any level, but are especially common in Badlands biomes. Badlands mine shafts will look a little bit different since all oak wood is changed to dark oak. Without spending too much time dissecting abandoned mine shafts, consider this. The sprawling, branching tunnels at multiple levels make these structures a naturally generated version of a strip mine, so bring along plenty of torches and you're likely to find a good amount of ores. Like dungeons, mine shafts may also contain chests with rarer items inside, like name tags and golden apples, and often items like melon seeds, glow berries, and some coal or torches to top off your supply. These chests will generate as a minecart chest and sit on a rail. They may also contain rails and redstone component rails. Speaking of rails, rails will generate throughout portions of the mine shaft, and if you have the inventory space, I do recommend collecting these. First, they're grabbed pretty quickly, especially with a pickaxe, but you can even pick them up without one. Second, if you ever plan on making your own rails, each one you collect will save you having to collect some iron, so unless you've already made an awesome iron farm, these are free resources. A word of caution, although parts of the mineshaft are lit up by torches, there's plenty of area for mobs to spawn. Additionally, another type of mob spawner is found exclusively here, cave spiders. 
Cave spiders are smaller than regular spiders and will poison you if they reach you. For clearing a mineshaft, follow these three tips to keep safe. First, choose a block or item to place as you go to find your way back. Make sure to remove these when you backtrack from a dead end so you don't end up with a branching path, but instead have a clear way back. Second, at intersections, temporarily block off the directions you're not ready to explore yet, including any openings above you or possibly even cave intersections. This will ensure that any mobs you encounter will be in front of you instead of sneaking up behind you. Lastly, when you do reach dead ends, block off or mark them in a way that is different than your other markings so you can easily keep track of what areas you've explored already. Bonus tip! In Java Edition, most mobs avoid crossing rails, so you can use this to your advantage. In Bedrock Edition, you can still create similar choke points by placing blocks next to the mineshaft's support beams, like this. Remember that you don't need to clear a mineshaft in one stretch. There's nothing wrong with leaving and returning to finish the job later, or even just choosing to be done whenever you feel like it. Lastly, because of the overall area they cover, there's a good chance that their generation overlaps with other underground structures. So exploring abandoned mineshafts is often a good way to find that dungeon for your future mob farm if you're looking for one. In fact, this was the way I managed to get into a stronghold without breaking any blocks in my own no mining, no crafting challenge. The remaining structures do all deserve their own full videos, so I'll keep the rest of them short. Strongholds house a special room with a portal frame. This will be how you enter the game's final dimension when you are ready. Like the abandoned mineshaft, these are large branching structures, and you can use many of the same tactics to explore them. Although the likelihood of just stumbling onto a stronghold by accident might be low, one thing worth knowing is that they are one of the few places where silverfish spawn. Silverfish do not spawn using the normal mob spawning cycle, but instead appear when infested blocks are broken and if they take damage from the player, they may summon other silverfish to escape their blocks as well. In a stronghold, all stone brick variants have a small chance to be infested blocks, and the portal room itself includes a silverfish spawner. Break this one, there's really no worthwhile farm to be made with silverfish, unless you want to get deep into experimentation with infested blocks. There are other places that silverfish may spawn, such as in biomes considered peaks, or slopes, or windswept hills, in which case any stone or deep slate block may be infested, though at a generally lower rate than stronghold blocks. Trial Chambers are a very recent addition to the game, offering new mechanics aimed at creating a more fun, combat-oriented challenge. Cartographer villagers may sell maps to Trial Chambers, and I'd certainly recommend waiting to enter until you feel ready, instead of rushing in if you do happen to stumble across one. Trial Chambers have an entirely new subset of spawners called Trial Spawners, which differ from normal ones in that they are not affected by light, they summon a set number of mobs at a time and in total. Once these mobs are defeated, they will spit out a loot item and go dormant for 30 minutes and they are activated by a combination of distance and line of sight. Oh, and they also take a long time to break. Trial Chambers do offer a pretty wide variety of loot, and could arguably be even better than Dripstone Caves for collecting copper. They are also the one place you can collect the components needed to craft a mace, and even then, only if you tackle the more difficult version of the chamber by drinking an ominous bottle on your way in. I'll save the rest for a future video. For now, let's look at the final underground structure you might run across. Ancient cities only generate in the deep dark and require a large amount of space. So as I mentioned previously, you'll want to look for these under broad areas of high terrain. I have personally not only found these under peaks biomes, but also meadows and jungles and badlands. The terrain elevation and area are far more important than the specific type of surface biome. Because of their size and special mechanics, we'll leave ancient cities for the next video. So now you're on your way to finding those diamonds and taking the next step into the broader world of Minecraft. I want to give you something to look forward to, so by now I'm probably wrapping up recording for the next video, where we'll peek into the depths of the deep dark and the ancient city, and how these areas require you to slow down a bit and tread carefully. I look forward to seeing you in the next one, and as always, 
Thank you for watching.